thank you, Shabo, and uh, thank you, Deborah. Now we open for discussions. Uh, could you introduce yourself? My the microphone? Is well, wait, wait a second. My microphone is coming. Thank you very much. It's a very, very comprehensive presentation. My name is Heather Jeffen from the private sector. And uh, the question I have often uh, Chinese accused of not uh, practicing ethical and what we call corporate responsibility. Uh, have you seen that in your experience? They've been criticized that they produce the same product that African can produce and then sell it uh, for lower price, so as such competing with the local production at the risk of losing uh, you know, income and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the one in the second row. Uh, my name is Pat Shake. I'm with the D U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Foreign Agricultural Service. I have a question for Deborah or for the gentleman, Mr. Chong. Um, Africa, any country you go in in Africa is resource limited. Uh, there have been a number of donors, whether they're European donors, individual country donors, the United States, uh, now Korea and others who are Japan who are all working in Africa. and. All of these donors are putting an increasing amount of pressure on these uh, governments in these countries. It, do you think, in your opinion, that, uh, and now we have, of course, the multilateral institutions asking these uh, governments to do certain things also. Do you think, in your opinion, that uh, the United States, as one of the largest donors, and China could work together to bring more coherence to uh, what it is that everybody is trying to, to do in Africa, and that is to improve uh, agricultural production and the standard of living for their people. Thank you. Regina, <coughs> and I come to this side. I'm Regina Birner from IFPRI. Thank you for this really interesting presentation and comments. Uh, you emphasized <coughs> this mutual benefit, and I was wondering whether you can explain a bit in a bit more detail what the mutual benefit is in case of these agricultural investments, because you pointed out this not for export, so is it the Chinese companies involved that, that gain, or what exactly is, is the benefit in, in this case, given that investments, say, in irrigation infrastructure are actually also quite expensive, so if they are not paid in with the oil or other resources, so where does the benefit exactly come from? Thanks. Yeah. Can I come to this side? Any questions from the left side? Thank you for the presentation. My name is Sophie Liu. I'm a student at SAIS. Um, this question is with regards to sort of CSR, corporate social responsibility um, of Chinese companies in Africa. So one of the major problems that China deals domestically is that um, local, gov uh, local governments and local companies have made a lot of money um, uh, producing goods, but um, they often don't follow a lot of environmental standards and social standard standards and are not accountable to, their lo to the local communities. And um, many of the local communities don't have a voice in expressing their concerns about the corporations that operate in their area because of governance issues. And this is clearly translatable in Africa, um, facing their own governance issues and um, with Chinese companies operating in African communities, whether or not, what sort of strategies the Chinese government has perhaps developed in the recent years to deal with um, governing their own companies operating in Africa. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, please. I'm Frederick Aaron, I come from State Department. Mm. Uh, I guess my question would be mainly, uh, has there been a change in Chinese policy over the last couple of years since the financial crisis? Uh, has that had any effect on uh, Chinese attitude uh, toward development, its policies overall? Mm. Well, this one on the left. Uh, Alan Cherry from the World Food Program. It's a, a little bit similar to the question Pat asked, which is Chinese have a different approach. and. How, what are the possibilities for China to exchange information and coordinate with other donors? I mean, for good or bad, the OECD DAC has become the body to coordinate most of the developed countries of the West. How can <coughs> we find ways to sort of, if you will, appreciate the differences of the different policies and coordinate to get the most development, development benefit exchange of information? Well, very good. So we have the first set of good questions. Uh, Deborah, can you uh, go ahead to uh, address 
the six questions, the shovel can also add later. And I think I actually covered this in two chapters in, in the book, in which I look at this industrial issue. Chinese exports to Africa in textiles have been devastating for a lot of African textile industries. They've lost lots of jobs in places like South Africa, Nigeria, all around West Africa. Um, and so that's really been a problem. And one of the reasons why it's been so devastating is that African governments have not supported their factories, um, in part because they've been pushed away from import substitution industrialization, which is what that was, their factories were doing. Uh, the, and they've then opened up their borders too under structural adjustments. So trade liberalization and moving away from industrial policies has, has opened up uh, their sectors for that kind of competition. The countries that have done a lot better in competing with the Chinese have been those that focused on exports. So Mauritius, for example, has done a lot better in terms of the competition. Uh, even Lesotho, Swaziland, all of those have, they suffered a bit when uh, the multi-fiber agreement ended in 2005, but most of them have been coming back on. South Africa hasn't recovered, on the other hand. So part of it is about um, having governments that can help their companies respond to competition, and that has not been the case. Now, um, in terms of, are they, I don't really think it's a matter of corporate social responsibility to refrain from competition. Because in a way, corporate social responsibility is about um, the, the social bottom line, the environmental bottom line, uh, treating workers fairly and all of this. But competition is a different matter. If you can compete fairly um, and not do it in, with a monopoly or other kind of position, then I don't think that's really, it's the responsible, the responsibility of a corporation is to win markets and business. So in that sense, I don't think we can blame the Chinese for winning markets in business. The question's more how do African governments respond and help their companies. Now, I'll just tell you a short story, which is um, one of the people I interviewed in Nigeria. And by the way, this book is based on field work. It's, I went all over Africa for numbers, lots and lots of different countries where I've been going since 1983. So uh, when I was in Nigeria last summer, I interviewed a um, a Nigerian businessman who has several joint ventures in manufacturing with Chinese companies. Um, and I've been going back to this part of Nigeria since 1991, so I keep, they call it the Japan of Africa or the Taiwan of Africa. It's a very um, dynamic entrepreneurial area. Well, he has a um, plastics factory where he employs a thousand Nigerians. He has three Chinese engineers that assist him there. And I said to him, well, I heard that the Chinese had wiped out, I read in the newspapers, the Chinese have wiped out the plastics industry in Nigeria. That's what I'd read, you know, the quotation. And I said, and yet here you are, you're employing 1,000 people, I see, like all these products. He, he led me all through his factory. He's, he's doing like 20 product lines. It looks quite successful. I said, well, how can you compete with the Chinese? And he said, well, it's not so hard. And he said, I use Chinese equipment. So I, I bring my machines from China. Um, he said, my raw materials are from Nigeria, it's petrochemicals, that's what we produce here, oil. Uh, so my raw materials are local. He said, I pay my workers the same salary that they pay in China. And I have distribution networks all over Nigeria and the neighboring countries. And he said, my quality is better, my prices are lower. He said, I'm basically wiping the floor with them. So he was like, I'm doing that. And he's doing it completely without government help. So it is possible. And we need to find more people like that. Uh, I'm sure there are others. In fact, there are others in that town who are also producing, sometimes in joint ventures and sometimes not. In terms of the other corporate social responsibility issues, uh, environment and uh, social standards, Chinese companies are not good in this area. The rumors that you hear about them are true. Uh, they have poor social standards, labor standards, safety standards, environmental standards across the board. And they also do in China. So this is, this is a difficult dilemma because how do you get a, a country that's risen from low income to upper middle income status very, very rapidly to also bring its standards up very, very rapidly? And this is a hard challenge. Now, I talk in the book about some of the uh, successes that people have had. Chinese companies are now starting to list on stock exchanges. They are starting to learn about reputational risk and uh, shareholder concerns. And so many Chinese companies and the Chinese government are interested in this topic. And just down the street, or up, up on Pennsylvania Avenue, is the International Finance Corporation, the IFC. 
which is a branch of the World Bank. They're responsible for developing performance, social and environmental performance standards for companies and the equator principles for banks. And they have told me that they have faced incredible demand from China. So Chinese companies, Chinese government ministries are asking for training. Are, they've translated the equator principles into Chinese. So there's a lot of demand to, to learn what this is about. Now, for that to trickle down to the thousands of Chinese companies that are operating in Africa and the tens of thousands that are operating overseas is going to take a while. And the Chinese government, many of these companies are private. Probably 80% of the companies in Africa are small, private Chinese companies. And the government doesn't have levers to change their behavior. So it's going to be a challenge. Now, that said, of course, we have our own problems with our own companies. One only has to go to Nigeria and the Niger Delta to look at environmental and social <laughs> problems that, that Western companies are still involved in. So, you know, we're, we can learn and help each other in this. Uh, we're, we're not completely good in that at either. In terms of um, donor coordination and the numbers of, of donors and, and trying to work together, um, African countries really are overwhelmed. And I think the donors realize this. Uh, and that is why in 2005, the OECD and the DAC proposed uh, and had accepted the Paris uh, principles on aid effectiveness. And part of the Paris principles are to try to get um, donor coordination. Now, I was just in Mali. We were just in Mali. And one of the things we heard uh, in Mali was that despite it's been now ten or five years since Paris, there are in the agricultural sector 250 projects and 30 different donors. And this is five years since Paris. And so, and none of these were Chinese, by the way. Um, so it's very difficult to have this happen. Now, I don't think the US and the Chinese can work together to sort this out. Uh, I think this is, um, this is a challenge that we really have. We have too much aid going in. We should, some people should, some countries should withdraw from some countries. We should specialize. There's so many different things that we should do. Um, the Chinese do not like to join these donor groups. And I think it's, it's, in some ways, it's obvious why not. First of all, they don't think that foreign aid has been all that helpful for ending poverty in Africa. There's, certainly, there are lots of examples of success. But overall, they, they think that foreign aid has gotten, uh, has, it does not have a hugely good reputation. And particularly, the consultative groups are always headed by the World Bank. And the, I have a sense that some of the Chinese agencies are competitive with the World Bank. For example, the China Exim Bank, I really get the sense that they see the World Bank as, as like a real competitor. And so to jo join in with a group where the World Bank runs it, is, um, they're less likely to have, to have that happen. There is an experiment in Cambodia where they seem to be joining in, so that's an interesting area. Um, I'll try to make my, my next uh, answer shorter. Um, there's been really no change since the financial crisis. I just say that there's nothing that's very significant, um, just that the Chinese saw this as an opportunity. And so they've been buying up more companies and doing more mergers and acquisitions in Africa. In terms of the mutual benefit in agriculture, I think uh, if you look at all the different actors, the Chinese government is benefiting because this is foreign aid, so they get kudos out of that. The local government benefits because infrastructure is developed. Uh, the local farmers benefit because infrastructure is developed. And the Chinese company benefits because it is supposed to develop something that it can sell, a service, maybe uh, technical assistance, advice, consulting, maybe um, hybrid seeds, maybe Chinese machinery. Uh, maybe it rents out the, the irrigation plots to local farmers. There's something that it does in order to make it sustainable and bring in income. And it's like a, it's a cross subsidy. It's actually something UNICEF did very effectively um, with uh, rural health clinics on, under the Bamako initiative. This, this is not a totally new idea, but it's, it's new in, in most foreign aid. Okay, I think I covered everything there. We have more time to discuss some of the issues here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, hi there. I'm Pauline Simmons with the Foreign Agricultural Service USDA. Now, I have heard some Africans uh, say that, yeah, you know, no matter what anybody says about environmental issues or what have you, they will go to the Chinese because the Chinese will give them what they want. And that, you know, maybe, you know, some of us in the West don't really listen to what they really want. We tell them what 
we think is good for them. Uh, so during your travels, did you hear the same kinds of sentiments from the African side as to how they seem to be engaging with the Chinese, you know, maybe more than they are leading towards us as they used to do in the past? Well, thank you. And the uh, next row then? This, uh, well, that one first, and this one. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Uh, Jess Wilhelm, formerly with IFPRI, now with USDA. Um, I'd like to ask what your recommendations are for civil society in Africa and international civil society to engage on poverty issues or human rights issues in Africa with the Chinese government and Chinese firms. Thank you. Uh, that one there. Thank you very much. My name is Azakaya. I come from uh, George Mason University. I'm taking my PhD in public policy. And I'm originally from Kenya, so this is uh, relevant to me and uh, my research too. Uh, I think the, the author and the uh, speakers have identified some of the key issues that we've been struggling with to understand, especially in the, the U.S., where most people still don't understand the relationship. And for somebody coming from Kenya, over the last 10 years, we've seen like a huge increase, for example, in um, air flights between Nairobi and uh, Shanghai, for example, because traders can fly directly to China and procure their goods from there. And like the US, well, for you to come to the US, the migration issues are so daunting that you won't even think about them. They don't even have a direct flight from Nairobi to, to the US. So that's an advantage for the Chinese because they allow free access to their markets uh, unlike other Western countries. But my point comes to the fact that we have a, a global value chain whereby a lot of African countries think that they cannot access the Western markets. So you have uh, policies like, like ECOA has been there for almost 20 years now, but the benefits are really negligible. So what uh, Ziabo, I don't know whether I pronounced it rightly, talked about the relocation of manufacturing, uh, low-cost manufacturing sectors to African countries, a lot of African governments do see that as a potential benefit to them. So other than focusing on Western countries to target with their products, they're seeing going through China as a better alternative than the policies that exist today. I would like you to comment on that. Well, right, thank you. Let's move to this side again. Any question from this side? Well, if, if not, um, maybe Shabu, you can go ahead. <coughs> this time, this round. Uh, maybe related to the last question on the relocating of Chinese manufacturers uh, to Africa. In China, this, in the last, since 2004, 2003, uh, China has, has faced a serious labor shortage, uh, air cost. Uh, China has reached the lowest turning point because the labor-intensive manufacturing has become less competitive than before. If you go to the coast area, talk to managers, entrepreneurs, the most common concern you hear is labor shortage. Actually, uh, in many parts of the coast uh, provinces, they already started move some of their investment overseas, Cambodia, Vietnam, Africa. Uh, in Ethiopia, I know a little bit more because have done a starting on industry uh, handroom clusters. Uh, in the uh, textile factory, you already see the Chinese investment. In the footwear uh, sector, uh, one of my former colleagues, Kijiro Suka and Sonobi, did a very good study on uh, footwear industry. They found in the last five years, the quality of uh, Ethiopia footwear has improved tremendously. One reason is because of the Chinese investment. They bought better, brought better equipment, production lines, also better uh, quality control. And then you have the over effect. In overall, the Ethiopia started to export footwear. But Ethiopia has a common advantage. It has livestock, it has a leather, tiny industry. It's very, uh, they have the uh, resource. As long as you bring ten compatible technology, it's very likely they become an engine of economic growth and bring more jobs. <coughs> I think this okay, Deborah. Yeah. Uh, let me just pick up on that thing about the industrial investment because this is something I've uh, I, I did a paper for the World Bank on this, which you can uh, find on their website somewhere. But um, these special economic zones 
uh, overseas economic zones are all about moving Chinese companies offshore and getting them to relocate and getting small and medium companies that, that are uncomfortable and don't know how to do foreign investment to get them to go global in groups as they say it. And so this is exactly what they're doing. And Ethiopia has one of these overseas zones. Uh, Mauritius ha is getting one, although that's not going to be so much for industry. Um, and Zambia has one and two in Nigeria. And one's supposed to be in um, Algeria. So it's, in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can see this as resembling the flying geese model that Japan used in Southeast Asia. It's the same thing with Japanese companies became too expensive in Japan. They moved into Thailand and Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. And the Chinese are doing a similar thing now. And it's happening very quickly. So in terms of ownership, um, uh, the Chinese do do ownership. Ownership is one of the principles of the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. But we aren't very good still at allowing African countries to have ownership of their development. We still use conditionality, uh, economic as well as, as political and governance related. And then uh, there are examples like I was in Sierra Leone talking to um, the Minister of Planning, former, because he'd just been voted out of office. So he was a little shell-shocked and he had a lot of time for me. <laughs> so I was asking him about um, a Chinese stadium that had been, was being built up country. And I said, why did you do this? You know, this is like such a, um, you need so many other things. Why did you ask the Chinese to build a stadium? You already have one. Why build a second? And he said, oh, he said, the Chinese really kicked against that. They did not want to do it. But we insisted. <laughs> and then they said, all right, we'll respect your choice. So, and then he said, the stadium's being built in the war area. It's something that the unemployed youth there, it's, it's something for them, it's political and it's a benefit to us, and we wanted it there, and the Chinese agreed to build it. So then he said, let me tell you what the Germans did. The Germans came, they said that um, they were going to give us a grant of like 40 million euros or something like that. I have this in the book. And, and the president of Sierra Leone said, that's wonderful, we'll use it for rural electrification. And then a few weeks later, they got a cable from Germany saying the grant was going to be used for the human security program that the Germans are already running. So, you know, they couldn't do the ownership thing, and the Chinese could. So do we think that money should be spent on stadiums? No. But that's what they thought in Sierra Leone. I'm sure the stadium was appreciated, too. That's a... The irony. In terms of civil society engagement on poverty human rights issues, there are some very interesting examples of corporate social responsibility engagement. Um, one of them is, is fine, was financed by USDA, actually, in Gabon. They financed um, some environmental organizations, global ones, World Wildlife Fund and, and Wildlife Conservation Society, to work together with Gabonese um, environmental NGOs, the Gabonese government, and a Chinese oil company that was prospecting for oil in a national park. And so these organizations all work together to develop a plan to do this in a much less environmentally uh, and socially disruptive manner. The, the government did allow this Chinese company there. That's where they told them, we want you to prospect for oil in this park. And the Chinese said they didn't realize it was a park and no one told them that. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. But nonetheless, this was widely regarded as a successful um, experiment at this kind of tripartite or even quadripartite engagement. And so I think financing uh, local NGOs, international NGOs, uh, to work in targets of opportunity where they might get a government that's willing to work with them on this could be very beneficial. And we've seen this happen. It's interesting in Kenya, um, I already talked about the relocation of the industry. Um, some of my friends in Kenya think that Kenya is one of the top um, targets for China. You know, they said to me, you know, we've got to be like, one of the most uh, the countries the Chinese are most interested in. And I said to them, not according to the data. You're not even in the top 10. And they were so surprised because the Chinese were so active there. And I said, you know, they're active everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, can we have the last round of the questions then before I conclude. Any others one in the back? Could you keep the quest question short? And there's another one. Yes, my name is Michael Carson with Axios Foundation and my question is uh, to Deborah. and you mentioned that uh, Chinese work with sending medical personnel. So I was interested in what they're doing in the health sector and particularly aid to African governments in the health sector. Okay. 
Thank you. There's a question here. Thanks. Uh, Preston Winter, I'm at the Millennium Challenge Corporation and a former student of Deborah. So. Um, I had a question about um, the private sector involvement um, on China's behalf. And I guess um, it's pretty evident that China has been able to, to use its private sector in a way that sort of ties in with its strategies in Africa and, and also to support them in investing and encourage them to invest. And um, at least at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we are trying to push the private sector and encourage the private sector to invest with us in the countries where we're engaged and to use um, sort of our stamp of approval on those countries to encourage that. So is there anything we can learn as, as the US government or as aid agencies um, from the Chinese in how to support you know, private sector investment and involvement. Thank you. There's a question here. Go. Jason Williams, State Department. Um, this was a follow-up question to Professor Brodigo regarding uh, donor coordination. Um, I know from reading your book that uh, the mm -hmm. president of uh, China XM, it didn't come out as being so adversarial, but it has a very different idea of what development sustainability is all about. What would it take, not just for you? World Bank, but yeah. other red uh, software for you, primarily bro. Western, but also Probably Japanese not. donors, what would it take to have genuine donor coordination with the Chinese? What or with ministries of commerce or MFA, whether in Beijing or, or African <coughs> capitals throughout? What sort of things would uh, donors have to, uh, private and, and national donors have to do be able to work successfully with the Chinese, but, yeah, thank you. in your opinion. Well, if you give a chance, if, if you keep it in very short, <laughs> and there's another one too, <coughs> and then we, uh, wrap it up. Uh, my, name is Gabriel, my name is Gabriel Lanza. I work for the FAO and a former student of uh, Dr. Deborah Debra Bradigam. My question is about brain drain. More African students want to come to study in the US versus China, or is that true or not true? Um, I'm from Tanzania. I see so many Chinese running the companies instead of training Tanzanian to work in the same companies. Um, do you think that's about to change, or will that change based on the education exchange programs? Mm -hmm. There's another one there. In the middle. I'm the Evanity from DRWDC. So my question goes the same line as. Uh, from a question. So what about these uh, African students who go to China, about 80,000? So is it a bilateral agreement between African uh, uh, countries and China to do so, and which field are they going to uh, study, or is it a requirement for them to go back in Africa and be, let's say, the interpreter between China and Africa? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, Deborah and uh, well, Michelle will first. And uh, Deborah, uh, not only addressing these questions, maybe some of your final comments too. Michelle Bo? Uh, I think on the bridge question is very interesting. But uh, when I was in Nepal, uh, you know, I stayed in a hotel. There was simultaneously a big meeting organized by the Chinese embassy, uh, offering scholarship to 8,000 Nepalis to, uh, to China. They offer four scholarships studying agriculture, medicine, engineering. And so I think there's uh, going to China, maybe there's can reduce the brain drain problem compared to going to US or other English speaking countries. They learn Chinese, it's hard to find jobs elsewhere. So maybe they have to return to Nepal to try to do some work related to the trade with China. So I, th I think maybe China's very smart the, for the China <laughs> African Development Fund. Well, I think one of the largest pillar is on training to bring uh, African students to China. So maybe they have long term uh, considerations. Thank you, Shabu. Uh, in terms of health um, cooperation, what the Chinese do is they send, uh, they basically have these um, revolving teams of doctors, um, and, and that was mentioned earlier, and they're like 20, 30 doctors, they stay for two years, and then they, they serve in the local hospital, and then they come back, and they're under the local doctors, so they're, they're not independent. 
Um, China is also building uh, 30 malaria centers and 30 hospitals, and as part of that, they are um, training African personnel. So it's something like a thousand uh, nurses and doctors or something along those lines. And I don't know if those will be part of the scholarships. Probably, uh, at this point, the Chinese just in November pledged that they were going to be giving 5,500 university scholarships per year to Africa. And so that's uh, it's a huge number. Now, those students, will they come back and be hired by Chinese companies? Well, I can tell you, I talked to one. <laughs> this looks like anecdote instead of data. Um, but this was not a student that was financed by China. It was financed by Nigeria. And he was back, he was hired by the Nigerian um, entrepreneur that I mentioned earlier as his interpreter to deal with the Chinese experts that had, were constructing another factory and installing the machinery. So, um, and he had studied agriculture, actually. <laughs> but there he was working in industry. In terms of um, the, uh, your question, Preston, when you think of China like Japan, you can think that China has a lot more instruments to promote business than we do. The developmental state is, is all about developing a lot of different tools and instruments to foster business, um, not just exports, but investment, all sorts of other things. We, don't, we have some of these, but we have an Exim Bank. Uh, our engagement with Exim Bank, if you look at the data for what they're funding in Africa, it's just minuscule compared to what the China Exim Bank is, is able to do. So that's one whole area for investment. And that's investment and uh, exports that, that Exim Bank can finance. Um, in terms of OPEC, you know, it's just a lot smaller. Um, and in terms of all the other, just, we do, the Commerce Department does go around and try to get companies interested. We, but we rely a lot on the private sector to do that. Like, you know, the, what is it, the Corporate Council for Africa? They hold these big meetings. Well, in China, that would be the Chinese government, you know, holding these big promotional meetings and taking them all around the country to try to get Chinese companies interested in investing in Africa. That's, uh, it's just a whole lot of energy uh, that they put into it. So we could learn from that. And chapter three, I talk about a lot of those instruments. Um, in terms of don donor coordination, I've been involved with the uh, OECD DAC, um, which has been trying to do this now for several years. Um, I've also been advising, uh, I've talked to DFID, I'm advising the Swedes, the Danes, um, and others on their efforts to try to coordinate, and it's really not easy. One of the difficulties is that um, in the Department of Foreign Aid in the Ministry of Commerce, there are 70 personnel, 70, you know, professional people. So, and they're very busy. So just, and in terms of in the field, they don't really have development people in the field. They have someone at the ministry, at the, uh, the local um, economic counselor's office who's assigned to look over the aid projects uh, and kind of oversee it. But it's mostly delegated out and, and subcontracted out to companies that implement them. So it's, there's not that much oversight work because the companies are kind of doing it. You just need to check and make sure, you know, problem solve if there's anything there. But with 70 people, it's really hard to get them to come to meetings. Um, we can talk, we can follow up and see you want to. Um, and, and the OECD DAC has been trying to get uh, coordination going, but they, their main partner has not been one of the central actors. It's the Institute of, at the International Poverty Reduction Center of China, and they're not a big aid actor. So, and Gabriel, I think I covered part of your brain drain issue. I think um, in terms of hiring Africans at higher levels, in Tanzania, actually, there are examples of this. You can see uh, in some of the Chinese construction companies that have been there for quite a long time, they have um, Tanzanians doing the bookkeeping. They have Tanzanian uh, surveyors, so at that level. But you're right, it's a real challenge for Chinese companies at the highest level to hire Africans, and the language barriers are a big part of that. So I, I think we'll see this change. Thank you, Deborah. Well, this has been a very rich discussion with the rather difficult, a rather challenging for me to summarize. What I will do is just to give you some of my reflection based on uh, discussions here, as well as, well as my, my own engagement with Africa in the last 10 or 15 years. The first is there's really need of information about what's going on in Africa. Uh, I think traditional donors' investment, we're struggling with that, you know, where the money goes, what is the impact, who, who is doing what, but now we add some new kids in the block, Chinese, Brazilians, and uh, Indians. So we need information. We need transparent information about who's doing what there. 
I don't think we have done a good job on that. The second is um, the Chinese engagement or the <coughs> engagement of other emerging donors like Brazilian and uh, Indians present different alternative development models. So their own experience in their country and their new way of doing business will challenge the traditional way of traditional donors. Right? So very ironic that I often sit in a traditional donors table, not in the emerging donors table, even, even though I'm a Chinese. So I feel that um, the information sharing to promote this sort of competition is, is very important, to, although the harmonization is also critical. So competition to um, offer different development alternatives, I think that will really, really change the global uh, aid landscape and uh, uh, architecture. The third point is the evaluation and an to experiment. I think have we done any systematic evaluation about the different donors, different um, actors in Africa and in other developing countries, their different aid modalities, how they have affected their development. So purely based on evidence, based on research, instead of uh, ideology, uh, ideology driven, uh, evidence based uh, evaluation of different alternatives uh, is very important. Then my last point is um, how China's engagement can really benefit each other. I think Regina raised this question in the agriculture uh, area. I mean, first, China's engagement should really avoid some of the Dutch disease problem. You know, the China's demand for natural resources is very high. So China's demand will push higher prices of minerals, oil. So if the country does not deal with that problem carefully, the Dutch disease can do more harm than good. Now, how China's engagement really avoid uh, that sort of uh, overvaluation of the exchange rate. So um, the Chinese donors as well as Western donors should pay more attention to that. Then in terms of agriculture, yes, indeed, I, I see tremendous <coughs> opportunity for both sides to win, China and, and uh, Africa. So by investing in agriculture sector, by investing in rural infrastructure, then obviously African poor will benefit, African um, rural people will benefit. So by doing that, the um, more production in Africa will also help China to, uh, to, um, to solve its own security, uh, food security problem. Deborah mentioned about the import of sesame, sesame seeds from, from Ethiopia. I see tremendous, tremendous potential for China's imports from all kinds of commodities. Cotton is already, well, cotton is not part of food. I think the, uh, the maize, uh, soybean. So China is importing 40 million tons of soybean from US, Brazil, uh, and Argentina. I think that some of my colleagues from USDA here may not like to hear this. But the potential of producing soybean in some part of Africa is just a tremendous. The problem, they don't have good seed. They don't have good soil. So by putting more food in others would help. They don't have good access to infrastructure ports, how can they ship the soybeans out? So I think the potential for China to use Africa to solve its food security problem is just great. We have not fully <coughs> explored that. And that sort of collaboration can really benefit both, both sides. Then, yes, indeed, China needs to pay attention to environmental standards, labor standards. So what, have, what have China has, has been doing inside of China, that does not mean it's right for them to do that in Africa. In fact, China has learned from their practice in Africa. Because the donor agencies, because Africans try to push a more higher neighbor, sta neighbor standard, more environmental standard, then Chinese government said, oh yes, we need to do the same thing in China too. So you see this sort of mutual learning, uh, a lesson learned by giving aids to Africa. So they try to improve their, their environmental standard, neighbor standard. Um, now China's engagement should go beyond the government. I think that that's the hard lesson that China really should learn. But in the past, the government, it's a government to government deal. 
so any large deals are signed between governments. So engage, engagement with civil societies, with the private sector, with farmers organizations are important. So that's why part of the reason the, uh, the anti-Chinese feeling in Africa is so strong is because lack of engagement with these broader stakeholders. And many African governments are not liked by their citizens. If you engage with government, then you're not going to be liked by the citizens. So that's another lesson China uh, really learned. And the Chinese aid architecture needs to be reformed too. Uh, for the last four or five years, IPRI has been engaged with the Minister of Commerce on, on its foreign aid policy. Yes, indeed, they are very hungry about the knowledge, knowledge information in Africa, in other parts of the world. Uh, every time when we go to China, they all call us, okay, tell us what's going on in Africa, uh, what's going on in Latin America, can we, can we do better? So yes, indeed, they demand for knowledge. But their, their aid architecture is in a serious problem. And most of the aid is controlled by Ministry of Commerce. Commerce is for business. <laughs> so if the aid unit is sitting with the commerce, obviously they will use aid for commercial business. So that's a conflict of interest. Um, and China needs to have its own professional separate aid agency. So we are really arguing for that. They need to have that one. Similar, like, similar to USAID, neutral, independent, uh, professional uh, aid, aid uh, architecture is very important. And um, I think the, one of the problem why China has not engaged with the traditional donors is their own lack of information, knowledge about what's going on outside. The lack of information leads to lack of trust. Indeed, yeah, they don't trust the tra traditional donors. They all see the, most of the aid failed. So why should we should learn from them? Why we should work with them? So their access to knowledge, information, to outside of the world is key for them to engage with traditional donors. The, so they, right now, the, most of the Chinese researchers are still very much focused on Chinese development experience and their implication on Africa. So very rarely you, you see some Chinese scholars who are specialized on Africa. Well, I have not seen that yet. So in the future, they need to better understand what's going on outside the world, yeah, what's going on in Africa. So their knowledge, their analysis, so then they can really increase their, their confi confidence. But in this early stage, I think IPRI, the uh, neutral independent international organization, can really play a key role there by linking two sides. Uh, we have been doing um, several act activities already, a uh, couple of training workshops in, in China. We went there to engage with African leaders um, and the Chinese leaders. Then um, IPRI can also provide um, certain knowledge and analysis for both sides to engage with each other. So um, for that, I think IPRI has a as a unique niche, uh, at least in the early stage, before China's own capacity uh, be, uh, is strengthened to engage with other donors. Okay, so um, thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Shobo. So when is your next book? Um, so we are waiting for your next book. Uh, hopefully we can invite you here again. All right, let's give them a round of applause.